I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate now turn to section one. You will hear a conversation between two flatmates, Craig and Don, who are looking for a third person to share their flat. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi Craig, been home long? Yeah, quite a time. Did anyone phone about renting the spare room? Yeah, we've had three phone calls about it. Really? Yeah. Do you want to hear about them? Sure. Right. The first one was called Phil Parrot. Uh-huh. He's a teacher. He's just qualified, and he teaches sports. OK. Actually, I'm not sure about him. He certainly sounded energetic, but he asked lots of questions about whether we smoked and what sort of food we cooked. Yeah. I mean, we don't exactly live on pizza and chips and takeaways. Well... Not quite, but... But he might be a bit too health-conscious to really fit in with the sort of life we lead. Yeah. And he asked a lot of questions about the room. He said he needs a big room because he's got lots of sports equipment. Well, th that's OK. The room's quite big, but I'm not so sure about him. What about the second one? He was called David Spencer. Spender? No, Spencer. C-E-R. He works at Cooper Long. You know, the big company on Broad Street. He said he was a lawyer. Oh. I'd have thought in that case he'd be earning enough to rent his own place. I wonder why he wants to share a flat. Well, he didn't say. He's quite a bit older than us. He did say he's just moved down here from the north of England. He seemed very quiet, actually. Maybe he wants to meet some new people. I got the impression he was a hard-working kind of person who doesn't go out all that much. Right. But he sounded OK. Oh, one thing, though. He said he wouldn't be staying in the flat at the weekends, so he wants to pay reduced costs for gas and electricity, because he's only here five days out of seven. Oh, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? Well, I suppose it's fair, but it all sounds a bit complicated. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Anyway, there was a third person, Leo Norris. Yes. He's an engineer. Oh, yeah. And he's about our age. Right. What did he sound like? Well, actually, he was really funny. I couldn't stop laughing when I was talking to him. He said he was very lazy and never got up until noon at weekends. And I said that wouldn't be a problem here. <laughs> no, certainly not. But actually, I suspect he was joking when he said he was lazy. I think he lives life as it comes. He's certainly not competitive or stressed, but he likes cycling and things like that. He sounds like an outdoor type. Anyway, I thought he sounded as if he'd fit in. He wanted to check if there was somewhere safe for his bicycle. That's not a problem. No, he can leave it in the garage with my car. So did you get his contact details? 
Yes, he left his mobile number. It's o triple seven six eight seven two four double three. And does he want to move in straight away? Well, he's paid his rent in his present place up to the thirty-first of September, but he said that if possible, he'd like to move in a bit before then. He said the twenty-eighth of September. And he was okay about the rent. Yeah, he said it was fine. Right. So shall we give him a ring and see if he wants to come round? And that is end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you will hear a talk between a host and a professor called Alison Downing about cocoa beans. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Hello and welcome to today's talk. Here with me is the famous botanist, Professor Alison Downing. So, Alison, tell us something about cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, also called cacao beans, are the primary constituent in making chocolate. Grown in tropical areas in South and Central America, West Africa, and Asia, the cocoa tree is often raised on small, family-owned farms. When the harvested pods are open to expose the beans, the pulp and cocoa seeds are removed, and the rind is discarded. The pulp and seeds are then piled in heaps, placed in bins, or laid out on grates for several days. During this time, the seeds and pulp undergo a process called sweating, where the thick pulp liquefies as it ferments. The fermented pulp trickles away, leaving cocoa seeds behind to be collected. This is when the beans are harvested, and then the bags holding them are ready to be transported. But the most important step in processing the cocoa bean is cleaning it. Once the beans are unloaded from the railroad cars, the packages are opened and then weighed by machines. Then the pods are split and the seeds or beans are covered with a sweet white pulp or mucilage. On arrival at the factory, the cocoa beans are sorted and put in a hopper to be cleaned more rigorously. The wet beans are then transported to a facility so they can be fermented and dried. They are fermented for four to seven days and must be mixed every two days. They are dried for five to fourteen days, depending on the climate conditions. The fermented beans are dried by spreading them out over a large surface and constantly raking them. Then the beans are ready to be roasted. Now. Roasting takes place at a high temperature, and then the beans are boiled in a heated chamber. During the roasting process, the beans will be expanded and cracked. But prior to this, the beans are trodden and shuffled about using bare human feet. During this process, red clay mixed with water is sprinkled over the beans to obtain a finer colour. Polish and protection against molds during shipment to factories in the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and other countries. Now back to what I was saying. After the beans are cracked, they need to be cooled. Then the roasted beans are sealed in pockets. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Wow, that is not a simple process, is it? But someone told me that different roasting levels of coffee can lead to different kinds of flavours. Yes, roasting coffee transforms the chemical and physical properties of green coffee beans into roasted coffee products. The roasting process is what produces the characteristic flavour of coffee by causing the green coffee beans to change in taste. Unroasted beans contain similar if not higher levels of acids, protein, sugars and caffeine as those that have been roasted, but lack the taste of roasted coffee beans due to the Maillard and other chemical reactions that occur during roasting. The vast majority of coffee is roasted commercially on a large scale, but small-scale commercial roasting has grown significantly with the trend toward single-origin coffees served at specialty shops. Some coffee drinkers even roast coffee at home as a hobby in order to both experiment with the flavour profile of the beans and ensure the freshest possible roast. So here, I'm going to introduce some of these roasted coffee beans and their special flavours. Now, the first crack is lighter bodied and has a higher acidity level with no obvious roast flavour and is popular for its special mild taste. This level of roast is ideal for tasting the full original character of the coffee. The green beans are raw, unroasted coffee beans. They are strictly hard beans with a smoky flavour and are slightly acidic. We've also got French roast and the flavour that comes across in French roast coffee usually has more to do with the roasting process than the actual quality of the beans. By the time the beans are dark enough to qualify as French, most of their original flavour has dissipated. In its place come the flavours of caramelising sugar, bittersweet coffee and often a bit of chocolate. And finally, espresso smoky, that is, coffee brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee beans. Espresso is generally thicker than coffee brewed through other methods, has a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, and has creamer on top. As a result of the pressurised brewing process, the flavours and chemicals in a typical cup of espresso are very concentrated. Espresso is also the base for other drinks, such as café latte, cappuccino, café macchiato, café mocha, flat white or café americano. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear three students discussing an assignment they are doing together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi Alice, wow, I'm about 15 minutes late. 
Sorry about that. The bus got stuck in a lot of traffic. You want to go over the presentation we have to do now, or get something to eat? No problem. There's always traffic at this time. Juan and I were thinking we could eat afterwards, you know, so we could relax and enjoy our meal. Sounds good. So let's go over what we have to do again. Okay. Well, since it's a long presentation, we'll work together on the different parts of it. What did we decide to call it again? I think it was Eastern European economies move towards democracy and capitalism. The professor said the presentation had to be how long? Hmm. He said about thirty-five minutes. That is how long the three of us are supposed to present. Then there will be a ten-minute question and answer session. Any student or the professor may ask us a question regarding the topic. Our grade also depends on how well we do in that part. We also have to write a summary of our presentation, right? Yes, the summary of our presentation has to be submitted one week before our presentation date. It must be five hundred words. How are we going to do the presentation? I thought we could give the class a basic handout, like an outline of our presentation. We could even create a poster with a map of the area we were talking about. Well, I was thinking we could make a slideshow using computer software and then using a projector during our presentation. People pay more attention to images on a screen. Hmm. Well, actually, I've never really used that kind of software. I always thought a basic handout or poster was sufficient. I think giving the information we have with visuals like that will really make our presentation stand out. Well, it would have to be done really well to make any sort of impact, and I'm not sure if that would be a good use of time. Maybe it would be better to spend that time on research and writing. I don't think it would take away that much time. Well, all of us have to research the assignment well and write a really good presentation. I think making a fancy visual presentation wouldn't help. Actually, I think such slideshows are distracting. People focus more on the images on the screen than what the presenters are saying. I'm still not sure I agree with you. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. All right then, let's go through some of the reading material. What was the main text we had? It's called "The Political Economy of the Former Soviet Bloc" by Fovac. That's spelled F-O-V-A-C. Yes, that deals with the specific area of Europe we are researching. There is also an "Economy in Transition" by Smith. That one is published by the University Press. Well, the professor suggested another useful book, one that focuses on the leadership of those countries. Sometimes the personalities of those in power affected historical events. It's called "Foisted into Power" by Brown, published by the Academic Press in 2005. Well, we still have to plan out a few more things, but I am quite hungry now. Shall we get a snack before we proceed? Definitely. I'm getting a sandwich. I need some rice with lentil curry. That's for sure. Let's go to the all-campus dining center then. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space, or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year, there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. Now you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year. Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock, or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. 
Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll show up. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up. I do so instinctive and so passionate Every word I move so descriptive like an adjective I got a vendetta against people who patented it Being negative when you should be getting after it I got facts over facts over tracks This and that spitting slow, spitting fast I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last But I don't know if that can erase all the past And the pettiness, a reflection of the emptiness Hilarious, you think you're worth my time, you're delirious Mysterious, because you are behind a fake exterior Inferior, you know I'll always be a bit superior Get off of me, this ain't no humble brag I want you to hear words, you can say them back I want you to feel free from the chains at last And to believe in what you got, it was built to last, yeah now that I've been put through hell, I never got anyone's help. I had to do it all myself.